Well, if you have your Bible this morning, and I hope that you do, would you open your Bible with me to Matthew chapter 4? We're going to look at verses 18 through 25 this morning. This is one of the five chapters that we've read. And I want to share with you something this morning. uh, uh, I want to share with you about something very dear to my heart, something that is really at the core of our, our North Park family, and that is about making disciples who make disciples. As we think about that, uh, I want to start with this morning with just a a question. What is your purpose in life? Do you know? A lot of people, when they're getting ready to go to college, they start thinking about that. But in actuality, I, I wonder if people that are older and mature in years are still trying to figure out what their purpose in life is. Well, what is it? What is it that gets you out of bed in the morning? What is it that, that gives your life purpose and meaning? Well, I want to help you out with that this morning. I believe that according to our Lord Jesus Christ, our purpose in life is really the same. It's one main thing. It's two words, make disciples. Whether you are a new believer or Uh, an older believer, we all live under the crystal clear mandate of what we call in Scripture the Great Commission, to make disciples who make disciples. And in our text this morning, we're going to see that Jesus intentionally called his first disciples to be a part of his D group, his discipleship group. And the word intentional is very important. It was a a very intentional act of our Lord Jesus. If you read the background, uh, we read about his baptism. We read about his uh, fasting as he went into the wilderness and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. We read about his temptation. And then right after he he finished that 40 days of fasting, he, he intentionally went out to choose 12 men to be a part of his discipleship group. And these 12 men that that came to be a part of that group were with him all through his three-year journey of life. Every time we read about Jesus in the Gospels, no matter what he's doing, these 12 men are there. They're a part of his life. So we learn from Jesus that the, the, when we think about disciple making, when we think about making disciples, how do we do that? How, how do we become intentional disciple makers? Well, according to Jesus, it, 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 the best place for that to happen is in a very caring, relational environment that we would refer to as a discipleship group. For Jesus, there were 12 that were in his group. For us, It could be three to five people that we intentionally invite to be a part of our life and and that we do intentional discipleship with them. And so the main idea I want to share with you this morning is that disciple-making is not a program, it's a lifestyle. We learn that from Jesus, we learn that from the 12, and I think it may be one of the most important lessons that I have ever learned in my ministry. And I guess we think, well, Pastor, why did it take you so long to have to learn that? And the answer is, I don't know. I don't know why it took me so long to learn that. When I went to seminary, they kind of taught us how to do discipleship as a program. But it was through reading of the Gospels, just like you're reading systematically through the Bible. It was through the systematic reading of the Bible that that God really convicted my heart that disciple-making, true disciple-making... It is not a program of the church, but it is to be the lifestyle that every believer lives. Just like Jesus Christ, we're to be intentional about living a lifestyle of making and multiplying disciples. And I want us to kind of walk through that uh, idea this morning. So would you stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word? And let's read it together. This is right after... In chapter 3, Jesus was baptized. Then in chapter 4, he had been in the wilderness fasting and and praying for 40 days. And right here, he begins his earthly ministry. Now think about how old Jesus was when he began his earthly ministry. He was 30 years old. And, And when he died on the cross, he was 33 years old. 
He only had three years of earthly ministry. And in those three years, he did a lot of good things. He he loved people. He healed people. He raised the dead. He did miracles. But I would say that the one main thing that this man did, that Jesus Christ did in his three years of earthly ministry, the one main intentional thing he did was he invested his life in 12 common ordinary men just like us. These were not seminary professors. They were not rabbis. They were not scholars. They were not preachers. They were fishermen. They were ordinary men. And it was these men that launched the movement that we're still here meeting today called the New Testament church. So let's see here is where Jesus launched that movement. It says in verse 18, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he called He saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, one of the most important verses in the Bible, I call this the Great Commission before the Great Commission. He said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets, they followed him, and going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a boat, with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left their boat and their father, and they followed him. Then he went through all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease, every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, when Jesus, your Son, walked on this earth, he not only taught us what to do with the words of his mouth, but he showed us what to do by the example that he led. The one main thing he did, other than to die for us on the cross, the one thing he did in his earthly body is he made disciples who went out to make other disciples. And Father, as we read through the New Testament, we can't miss it. Disciple-making is indeed a lifestyle, not a program. A lifestyle that common people can learn how to live and impact their world, and make Jesus famous. God, teach us about that this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so this morning, we see in our text that disciple-making is not a program, it's a lifestyle. When Jesus went to 12 men and said, follow me, and I will make you fisher of men, he in no way was getting them to be a part of a program. He was not signing them up for some kind of program that would be a, a ministry of, of a church or of an organization. But he was, he was living a lifestyle that he would teach them how to live. He said, if you'll come and follow me and be a part of my discipleship group, I will train you how to go out and do the same thing. And, and I would suggest to you, beloved church, that when the church started at the very beginning of the church, when the church was filled with the Holy Spirit, that what they did as the New Testament church is exactly what Jesus taught them to do. I mean, they didn't know how to do anything else. It was the only thing they had learned to do. They didn't have buildings. They had no buildings like we have. They had no church buildings. They had no budgets, like we have budgets to do ministry. They had no buildings, they had no budgets, but they did a greater work of of reaching the world for Jesus and making him famous than we do today with buildings and budgets. And the reason that they could do that is, is they knew how to make disciples who go out and make disciples. You could imagine a discipleship group meeting in a home and growing so rapidly it had to multiply to another home and had to multiply to another home. And, and they were just spreading the gospel throughout all Jerusalem, Judea, the Decapolis by doing one thing, making disciples who make disciples. And so notice with me three things 
Number one, there is an invitation to be a disciple. There is an invitation. And we see it right here in our text. It says that while walking by the Sea of Galilee, as he's beginning his earthly ministry, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. They were blue-collar, hard-working fishermen, rough around the edges. <laughs> uh, they, you know, were not highly respected in society. They were not wealthy. As far as we know, they had no, no formal training And Jesus said to them one of the most powerful statements in the New Testament. Ten words, but ten words that teach us about our purpose in life. Ten words, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. I want us to unpack these ten words today. Because I believe this is the Great Commission before the Great Commission. It's unmistakably clear it's, it's a, a brief statement. There's brevity of Jesus' words, but they're so, so powerful. Jesus is intentionally inviting these men to be a part of his discipleship group. And, and I think to be a disciple maker, listen to me, come in here with me. I guess the hardest thing to this deal is inviting people to be a part of of a discipleship group with you. If we're going to be disciple makers, that, that's what it takes. We have to invite people to come and be a part of a discipleship group with us. And, and that has to be something that we pray about and that we're very intentional about. Before Jesus called these 12 men, Luke tells us what he did. In Luke chapter 6, verse 12, In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray. And he spent all night, and he continued in prayer to God. And when day had come, he called his disciples and chose them to be 12. So what did Jesus do before he called the 12? He spent all night in prayer. And I think, obviously, what he was praying about is, God, who do you want me to call? Who are the men that you want me to invite to be a part of my discipleship group? So if I'm going to be a lifetime disciple maker, then then my life will be spent like this. I will be praying, God, who should I ask to be a part of my discipleship group? And I'm going to try to get a group of three to five men. If you're a woman, you would want to pray and ask God, what women? You know, could I invite to be a part of a discipleship group with me? And, And I want us to come together for intentional discipleship. A discipleship group can meet anytime and anywhere. We're not limited by Sunday morning meeting in the church. We can meet anywhere. We can meet anytime. We can meet outside, inside. We can meet at schools. We can meet at uh, places of business. We can meet at parks. We can meet at restaurants. We can meet in neighborhoods. And, And what we do in a discipleship group is we read the Bible, we discuss the Bible, we go out and do ministry together. That's exactly what Jesus taught us to do. He, he would tell stories, he would teach the disciples, and then they would go out and they would do ministry together. And uh, in, in the second thing, notice there is the transformation of a disciple. Uh, there's invitation, then there's transformation. And he said to them in the second part of that verse, he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. But let's focus on these next three words, next four words. He said, I'm going to make you, I'm going to make you into something that you're not right now. If you follow me, Jesus said, if you choose to be my follower, then I'm going to make you into something that you are not right now. It's going to be transformational. I have found through disciple making, the way Jesus taught us to do it, it is the most transformational thing that we will ever do. It is the most fruitful thing that we will ever do. And and Jesus said that that I'm going to make you into something that you're not right now. We'll come back later to what he said that they would become. But notice what happened. When these men decided to come and follow him, he went throughout all Galilee teaching in their synagogues. So these men are following him, 
And what are they doing? They're listening to Jesus' teaching. They're watching him teach. They're hearing him teach. They're learning how to teach. Often, as we read the Gospels, you'll find this in our reading, that when he would teach, he would tell parables. He did that so often. He would tell a story, and then when the 12 were around him by themselves, they would ask him about the story. They would discuss it. You do not have to have the gift of teaching to be a disciple maker. What we do is we use our influence with a group of three to five. We use our influence to read the Bible together systematically and to discuss it. John Maxwell, if you ever have read his books on leadership, he's a leadership guru. He's written lots of books. I love his simple definition of leadership. He says, leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. Leadership is influence. And and I believe that's so true. And, And so there are many ways to influence others. The way that we as disciple makers choose to influence others is to go to someone and say, I'm starting a discipleship group group of guys. We're going to drink some coffee. We're going to read the Bible. We're going to discuss it. We're going to go out and do some nice things for people. Would you like to be a part of that group? And by reading the Bible and holding people accountable to read the Bible, we let the Bible do the teaching. Systematically reading the Bible is the most life-changing thing that we can do. And then we're not only going to systematically read it, but we're going to discuss it. And we're going to discuss it together and have great discussions together And then I'm going to use my influence to say, hey, we're going to go out and do some ministry and evangelism together and and learn how to do that together. In our discipleship groups, as we think about intentionally developing a group, there's diversity in the group that Jesus called, and we want to create that diversity as well. One of the first things that I do to start a group is I try to get another mature believer to join me. I would say, hey, let's start a group together. Would you help me lead this group? Would you, you know, help me to to fish for some other men? And then I try to get a brand new believer. If I can find a new believer, there's no one that's more needy of being discipled than a new believer. And try to get a new believer in my group. I try to get a believer that may be struggling with spiritual growth or struggling with issues in their life. And then I try to get an unbeliever to join my group. If I can get an unbeliever that's not church but that's open, I would love to get an unbeliever. I say to guys, hey, I'm not inviting you to a church. I'm not inviting you to, to, to anything like that. I'm just wanting you to come hang out with me. And we're going to read the Bible and we're going to discuss it and we're going to go out and do, not, do nice things for people. And if we can get an unbeliever who, who is open to reading the Bible and discussing it and going out and doing good things for people... I believe that in time, yeah, we will lead them to come to church, but more than that, we'll lead them to Christ. We'll lead them to Christ organically. And and, and so we want to uh, teach. And then notice he was proclaiming the gospel. So he's not only teaching the, the word of God, but he's sharing the greatest message of the Bible, the gospel of Jesus Christ. How did these men learn how to share the gospel? Right here. I mean, Jesus started immediately sharing the gospel, taking them out, and they learned how to share the gospel by watching Jesus. Now, notice what else he did. He not only was teaching and proclaiming the gospel, but he went out healing every disease, every affliction among the people. His fame spread throughout all uh, Syria, and they brought him the sick and those oppressed by demons, those that were paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed from Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. So he taught them. He he taught them through the word of God. He taught them how to share the gospel. And then he took them out and did on-the-job training. How did they know how to minister to people? How did they learn how to care for the sick and the afflicted? That's what he did with them. He took them out and they did it together. And they learned by observing and watching Now, what did he do later? You remember later, he paired them up two by two. And he said, now that you have learned from me, I want you to go out two by two, and I want you to go and minister. I want you to go and share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we call that in today's society? We call it mentoring. 
right? It's mentoring. It's, it's personal. And, and that is why disciple-making is so more effective than just teaching a large group class. Uh, I believe in teaching the Bible. I, I'm teaching it today to a large group, and I love it. I love to preach. I love to teach. The things that we do in our teaching the Bible are very important. But also, our teaching should have the ultimate goal of training people that have learned the Bible through teaching how to go out and be disciple makers and use the things they've been taught to influence others to read the Bible, share the gospel, and to go out and and do ministry together. And that is what we're seeing happen here at North Park. Uh, We're highly committed to that. It's a movement that started here and literally is spreading around the world today. We've got over a thousand churches in the U.S. who have joined us in, in this movement. Uh, we've, we've had people here that have taken it overseas just recently. Um, we have, have seen it multiplying in Ecuador. And, and our goal is to see that global grassroots movement. My prayer here at North Park is, is that key leaders of our church who have influence in, in the business world, in the school world, or wherever you are, that, that, that God will begin to use you to start discipleship groups, to lead discipleship groups, and to multiply discipleship groups all over the world. Galatians 4.19, Paul said, My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. That's the ultimate goal of disciple making. And you can't do that with a big group. You can't form, help develop the person of Christ in a congregation. But I can take a group of three to five men that I hang out with every week and get intimate with, and together, we, we, through the accountability of that group and the mentoring of that group, we can see Christ being formed in, in those individuals. And that is our heart's desire. And as Christ is being formed in them, Well, what does that end up being? That ends up being multiplication. Because what was Christ? He was a disciple maker. And as Christ is formed in us, we then want to go out and make other disciples. I love this quote by Stuart Weber in his commentary on Matthew. He said this, watch. You will notice as Matthew's gospel unfolds, and I want you to watch for this as you read it, that while Jesus did not ignore the crowds, He was primarily engaged in teaching the 12. Think about it. He says, even when he ministered to the thousands, it was in the context of teaching the 12. Okay, I want you to begin to watch for that. In Matthew 5, we're going to start reading, or we already started, but we're going to finish reading this week what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Notice in chapter 5, verse 1, it said the crowds came near to him and the disciples. While he was teaching the multitudes, you know who were there watching and learning? The twelve. When he went to feed the 5,000, we focus on the miracle of him feeding the 5,000. And and that was awesome. That was a great miracle. It ministered to a lot of people. But you know who were there learning? You know who distributed the miraculous baskets of food that he provided? You know who were watching and learning? You know who were there? The 12. And so you start reading the Bible right now with the understanding that everything he did in all four Gospels, he did it in the context of discipling the 12. And that is the lifestyle he's called us to live. Yeah, we can teach classes and we can do great ministry, but we are to do it in the context of discipling some others that we are bringing along with us. The last thing I want you to notice is there is the multiplication of a disciple. So there's invitation, transformation, and multiplication. That's that's the heartbeat of discipleship. Invitation, transformation, multiplication. Notice the last part of verse 19. Follow me and I will make you what? He he could have said anything right here. He could have said, follow me and I'll make you good people. (laughs) Follow me and I'll make you, you know, people that, that love to worship or love to sing or love to whatever. But Jesus said one thing. If you follow me, here's what I'm going to make you into. 
a, a disciple maker, a fisher of men. That was his way of communicating to fishermen, I'm going to make you into a fisher of men. Beloved church, has that changed for us? I mean, is that, have, has that changed? Does the Bible change? Jesus said, if you follow me, and I'm a follower of Jesus, I would think that we all are in this room. Many of us are. Jesus said, well, I'm going to make you into something you're not right now. And my goal is to make you into a disciple maker because it is by disciple making that we can change the world. And boy, does the world ever need to be changed. And so when he said that to them, were they willing to make that commitment? I mean, were they willing to commit to something that was such a high calling? Well, immediately they left their nets and they followed him. They left, I mean, they made a commitment to this. They left their fishing nets to learn how to fish for people. And then it says he went from there and saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother. They too were in a boat with Zebedee their father mending their nets. And he said the same thing to them. And immediately they left their boat, they left their father, and they followed him. Is, is it a high calling and a big commitment to be a lifestyle disciple maker? Well, let's, let's be totally honest. It is. I mean, if it's intentional, if it's something we commit to do, uh, it, it, is a, it is a high calling and a big commitment. Is it a commitment that we should all be willing to make? Well, but the example of Peter and Simon Peter and Andrew, James and John would say they were willing to sacrifice a great deal to be a disciple maker. Now, I will tell you this. That being a disciple maker for me has been one of the most fun things I've ever done. I've been able to build relationships with men that I really was only acquaintances with, many of them before uh, we got in a discipleship group together. And I love that. I have been able to build intimate, close relationships with a lot of men that are in this room right here. And we've discussed the Bible together. We have a lot of fun doing that. We go out and do nice things for people and do ministry and share the gospel together. And, and, and it is not hard. He, he called these common men to teach us it's not hard. He, he taught us how to do it. It's a simple process. But if we'll do it, it will be life-changing. The hardest thing is to get our groups together. We had a guy in our church that led a discipleship group. Now listen, what I'm about to say is very important. He started a discipleship group. And he led it all the way to multiplication. And he, got, and he, was, he was ready to multiply. And he came to me kind of with an uh-oh moment. And he said, Pastor, I realized how few friends that I have outside the context of the church. He said, when I got ready to multiply my D group... I didn't have any more friends to invite to be a part of my discipleship group. Can I just say to you that's an aha moment? Because that's true for many of us in this room. We have a circle of friends that we might could start a discipleship group with, but if we were to multiply, do we have another circle and another circle after that and another circle after that? Most likely not. And that is why we're not reaching our world for Christ. Do you think we're going to reach our world for Christ by going up to total strangers and saying, hey, if you die today, do you know you'd go to heaven? Most of those total strangers, unless it's just a super divine appointment, are going to look at us like we're crazy. So, so the only way we're ever going to be effective at true evangelism is to understand we've got to have more than our context of friends that are part of the church that we already go to. We've got to open up to praying about, God, who should I ask? We've got to open up to living lives of hospitality to people at work and in our neighborhood and people that, that we build relationships with on purpose, intentionally. And then we say to them, hey, I don't care if you go to church or not. I'm not trying to you know, I, I'm not forcing anything. I'd just like for you to come hang out with me and drink some coffee. Let's read the Bible. Let's discuss it. Let's go out and do some nice things for people. That's what it's going to take till we reach our world for Christ. And you know it. And, and it may call you out of your co uh, comfort zone to start building relationships with people that you don't already know. But the very calling of being a believer is we're called out of our comfort zone, Right? And we're called to be loving and kind and people of hospitality and open our hearts up to people that we don't already know. 
The threefold purpose of a discipleship group, and we see it right here from the example of Jesus. Number one is to grow in spiritual maturity. So when I have a group of three or five men, or my wife has a group of three or five women, or you do as well, we are going to make sure through the discipling, mentoring relationship that we're growing. We're going to read the Bible together. We hold each other accountable to that. We're going to discuss it. We're, we're going to be able to ask questions to each other and answer questions that you would never be asked today in a worship service. I mean, I want to ask you point blank questions about how are you applying this, but in a, in a discipleship group, we do. People grow through the accountability, the loving spiritual accountability, and the Bible focus of a discipleship group. The second goal is to serve in missional ministry. Jesus took his disciples, we see it right here in the text, outside the walls of any church, and they ministered to people and shared the gospel. At North Park, we have a goal for all of our discipleship groups that they do six ministry projects a year outside the walls of the church. That means that six times a year, every D group prays about God, what can we do to show the love of Christ in a practical way? And then they go out and they do it, and they, share the, they carry the evangelism Bible. They share the gospel. We're trying to move more and more of our ministry outside the walls of the church in a very organic way. Our goal in 10 years is to have 400 discipleship groups. That means 400 people that we've trained, we've multiplied out to lead discipleship groups anytime, anywhere, and that those 400 discipleship groups do 2,400 ministry evangelism projects outside the walls of our church. Beloved church, who would not want to see that happen? I mean, that should be something that we pray about, that we work toward. That is the kind of ministry that will make Jesus famous. We have a world out there of people that need to be shown the love of Christ, that need to be discipled. And, and you can help us to accomplish that. I pray this year that if you're leading a discipleship group, you will be intentional about leading your group to do six ministry projects outside the walls of the church. How many days do we have in a year? 365 days. God's going to give you 365 days this year. Do you really think that six days out of 365 days, you can't go out intentionally leading a group of three to five to go out and show the love of Christ and to share the gospel? Guys, if we're not willing to give six days out of 365, we don't want to reach the world for Christ. We don't really have a burden to reach the world for Christ. But if we do it together, if we all do it, if we have 10 D groups do six, that's 60 times a year. We are outside the walls of our church attempting to lead people to Christ. The last thing is to reproduce disciple makers. So the threefold goal, to grow in spiritual maturity, to serve in missional ministry, and to reproduce disciple makers. Jesus said to the 12, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Three years later, three years of training, three years of taking them out, he died for them on the cross and he rose from the dead. He was about to ascend back to the Father. And what did he say to them? He said, oh, hey, all authority has been given to me now in heaven and on earth, and I command you to do one thing. There's only one verb in the Great Commission. In the Greek language, there's only one verb. And the one verb in the Great Commission is make disciples. It's crystal clear. He said, if you follow me, I'm going to make you a disciple maker. They followed him. And three years later, he said, all right, now you're ready. I passed the baton. Now go and make disciples. And there are three descriptive participles that tell them how. He said, all authority has been given to me. Going is one of the participles. Go, you go, anytime, anywhere, everywhere you go, be thinking about making disciples. Go, make disciples. Baptizing is the second participle. When you lead them to Christ, bring them in the church to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then teaching is the third participle. Teaching them what? To observe all that I've commanded you. So you go, you make disciples, you lead them to Christ, you baptize them, and then you teach them to do what? Everything I've commanded you. What is the one thing he just commanded them to do? 
make disciples. It's a reciprocal, never-ending, multiplying process of making disciples who make disciples. In John 14, 12, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I'm going to my Father. Have you ever looked at that verse? Jesus said, if you believe in me, you're going to do the works that I do. Well, the one main work that he did was he poured his life into 12 men and multiplied them out. But he said, you're going to do greater works than me. Now, there have been some that have taken that verse out of context. And they said, oh, we're going to do greater miracles than Jesus. (laughs) And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Jesus walked on water. I've never seen anybody do that. I mean, Jesus turned water into wine. I've never seen anybody do that. I mean, Jesus healed not just a few people, but everybody that came to him, he healed them. I've never seen anybody do that. Jesus took a man who was dead for four days and said, Lazarus, come forth, and he came back from the dead. I've never seen anybody do that. Now, I believe that God is still doing miracles, and you do too. We see miracles that God does in response to prayer. But I don't believe any person is going to walk around doing greater miracles than Jesus. But that's not what he said. He didn't say you're going to do greater miracles than me. What did he say? You're going to do a greater work than me. What was the one main work Jesus did in his three years of earthly ministry? Transforming 12 common ordinary men into disciple makers who started a movement that's still going today. And he said, you are going to do a greater work than me because there's one of me, there's many of you. I have three years, you're going to have many years. You are going to do a greater work than me. Disciple making is the greater work. John MacArthur said in his commentary, these men were Jesus' first partners in ministry. He had the power and the right to accomplish the work of proclaiming the gospel by himself, but that was not his plan. He could have done it alone, but he never intended to do it alone. From the very beginning, his ministry, his plan was to use disciples to win disciples, to make disciples who make disciples. This is our purpose in life. Disciple making is not a program, it's a lifestyle. Beloved church, it's a lifestyle that I love, and I will be living it for the rest of my life. I, someday I probably will need to let a younger guy take over as pastor of this church. Not anytime soon, but someday. But when I do, I will continue to make and multiply disciples until the Lord takes me home. I, I'm, I believe this is my supreme purpose in life. I'm going to do it now, and I'm going to do it until the day that I die. Because living this lifestyle is my main thing. It's what Jesus said he would make me to be. And we want to help you with that. If you would like to join a discipleship group, there's a card in your ministry guide. Would you take it out and look at it? It looks like this. Uh, One of the best ways to to learn how to make disciples is get involved in a group. And if if you would like to join a D group, Uh, Down at the bottom, it says, I would like to be in a D group. Just fill the card out, write your name, put an email address. We'll help you get connected with the group. If you would like to help lead a group or start a group, then we have training coming up in uh, a week or so on January 22nd. Uh, You'll see it on the insert there. It's our statewide D-Life boot camp. Last year, we had over 125 people right here in this room from all over our state that came to learn how to live a lifestyle of disciple making. And I've heard from many of those churches, and they've started this in their church. This year, uh, we've already got several from Georgia coming. We've got people from Alabama coming. If you've never been through this training, we don't talk about disciple making in this training. We train you how to be a disciple maker as a way of life for the rest of your life. And so, so you can put your camera over the QR code, and we'd love for you to sign up. And be a part. If you're leading a D group, uh, we need your help. We're going to use some of our D group leaders to lead breakout sessions. And so if you could um, lead a breakout session, if you'd like to lead a group, then uh, we need your help to come and and, uh, be a part of the train. Help us lead discipleship groups. Beloved, I've never been more excited about what God is doing. Never in my life. I've never felt more liberty and freedom in ministry. I've never been more excited about what God's doing in a church. 
You know, I've really just gotten away from this Sunday morning being a show or, you know, lights and smoke. And, you know, we're just common, ordinary people singing, worshiping, preaching. But it's not about that. It's about a grassroots movement, a global grassroots movement of people like me and you learning how to go out and make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And if we as a church will do that, we will help make Jesus famous on earth as well as any church in America. And I pray that you will pray about it, pray about being a part, pray about uh, what God is doing in the life of our church, and let's just see what God does. My son Jared, <laughs> he, he's a funny guy. I love Jared. He's my youngest son. And a few years ago, we moved to Springville. We got a little lake that is in our backyard. And Jared never fished before, but since we live on, on a little lake, he decided to start fishing. And so he would get his fish. He started buying fish and tackle. He learns everything that he does from YouTube. He'd watch YouTube, how to catch fish. And I mean, every boy, when Jared gets into something, he does. So every day I'd see him get his fish and tackle and he'd look at me and he would say this. He would look at me with a big smile on his face. He would say, these fish ain't going to catch themselves. <laughs> and he said, they're, these fish, they're not going to catch themselves. That's Jared. And can I tell you something? We got all these hurting people out there. They're not going to walk in the doors of our church. And they're not going to catch themselves. We've got to have people that are willing to be fishers of men. Father, we need you. God, we need revival. And I've learned more and more that revival is not just some mysterious Thing. There is that element of the Spirit in it for sure. But a part of revival is us doing our job. It's being obedient. It's to quit playing games, to get real. And Father, I pray that you would begin to raise up from among the ranks of our church, men and women, common people that are willing to make disciples who make disciples. Father, if there's anyone here today that's never given their life to Christ, that's where it all begins. I pray that today would be the day that they open their heart to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If that's you, if you would like to open your heart to the gospel this morning, just pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I need you. I, I don't want to live without you another day in my life. I believe that you died for me and rose from the dead. And today, I put my faith in you. I want you to forgive my sins. And I want to follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I'm going to be out back in just a minute. I'd love for you to come by and let me know. And if you're watching online, you prayed that prayer. Send me an email. Send me a text.